Hello everyone and welcome back for our next lecture on assessing reliability and validity. We've talked a little bit about these concepts and they're super important in research methods. So we viewed them before as concepts related to variables and measurement in general. And now we'll be thinking of sort of the back end of your projects and the reliability of the assessments you've given and the validity of the studies you've done uh, and maybe the generalizability and statistical validity, we call it associated with that. Um, so we'll discuss some of these examples also through the book uh, that help exemplify these, but I've tried to tailor this down to some of the key bits, uh, pieces of information that I hope that uh, will help you understand this uh, the most. Uh, reliability and validity is super important. And in this case, remember, um, we're talking about scales and manipulations, right? So we're talking about the um, really the clarity and accuracy um, that we can obtain of the results, right? Um, so when you think about the scores from people, are they consistent uh, across maybe coders or people? And of course, are these uh, valid in terms of the constructs that we're trying to assess and maybe for different audiences that these variables can in interact with, right? Um, maybe different um, genders or different types of communities. Uh, that sort of thing. So remember when we talk about measurement, just as a quick review, uh, something like negative affect can be you know, measured through negative comments in a qualitative sense, through a quantitative uh, inventory like the Beck Depression Inventory or some other multiple item scale, or even biological indicators like serotonin or something like that, uh, some sort of um, chemical associated with a cognition or a thought or emotion. So, of course, when we speak of reliability of these measures, um, I'll be having you assess the reliability of any scales that you distribute uh, by looking at how much of the individual's true score uh, versus what we say measurement error exists in the data. Um, and we get an approximation of this with various sorts of indices, right, like Cronbach's alpha, uh, showing the approximate reliability of, let's say, an internal consistency measure, or how the internal uh, uh, items of that scale uh, correlate with each other and maybe the overall scale score, right? Uh, versus sort of the randomness and responses that we wouldn't expect by giving people uh, items that should be conceptually and construct similar. Uh, so the different ways we assess this, of course, uh, is inter-rater, internal, and test-retest. Uh, the one I've been describing is internal consistency with multiple item scales, but there's also inter-rater, which I reference a lot, especially with qualitative like uh, studies like the comic stuff that I do, uh, where you're having people judge, let's say, the, um, the occupation or the um, nation of origin of a character. Um, you can have agreement uh, or disagreement there, and that's kind of important, right? Uh, when it's rank ordered, it's inter-rater reliability. When it's accuracy, we call it something a little bit different. Uh, that's inter-rater agreement, uh, but similar sorts of stuff. Uh, although agreement might be argued to be a little bit more uh, angled at validity since it's a, sort of a construct validity thing that we're calling uh, someone um, a certain thing if they're a certain thing, right? Um, anyways, even judging their occupation, you can get disagreement on that. And test retest, of course, is over time, right? So those consistency elements add to what we call the internal validity a lot of times of the overall study, right? The better you measure these variables, the more argument you have for cause and effect. So it's all really linked, right? Um, so validity itself has, has these internal sort of components that I'm just speaking of, the external components related to whether these results would hold or um, be generalizable to other audiences, right? Um, so if you do something on, a, let's say, a, a medicine to cure depression, I shouldn't say cure, but help treat uh, <laughs> depression, uh, would this work on men and women? Would this work on, you know, different age populations or people with pre-existing other um, comorbid sorts of psychological uh, uh, sorts of, um, you know, characteristics? Uh, that would be very important, right? Because you'd want this to work for everybody. And then finally, contract valid, of course, is whether you're confident that this sort of uh, manipulation you're doing or the scale you're using is really representative of the, the concepts that you're talking about at that deep level uh, deep in that literature review, let's say. You can also, and your book characterizes this as a four quadrant thing. So of course there's the internal and external and the construct validity represented in this typology. 
uh, or this sort of uh, you know depiction or view of validity, um, but they also add what's called statistical validity that we'll go over. Um, so uh, this is the new one. It's kind of the idea that the results you get uh, agree or coincide with the sorts of theories or propositions that you put forth uh, in these hypotheses and things like that. And the the overall strength of those uh, validities are important, right? Um, so the size of those correlations, the uh, size of that um, F or T value or uh, the uh, P less than value in terms of your significance test, right? So when we look at internal validity and something like, let's say, causality, right? When we think of causality, let's go back to a, uh, for a moment to the idea that it's, remember, covariance, that they're correlated, uh, that A happens before B, that temporal precedence, and then it's a valid sort of uh, assessment of this relationship without many confounds or other things getting in the way, right? Uh, so causality is a sort of good vehicle to discuss internal validity uh, or this idea that we're measuring what we think we are and we're confident that the uh, effects we're speaking of are due to the sort of manipulations or variables we say they are, right? Um, so experiments can support this by, you know, using IVs and DVs and random assignment um, in a way that you can uh, look at a variable, like let's say a type of uh, instruction uh, and eventual, you know, intelligence or ability levels, uh, and randomly assign people to conditions such that uh, you can wash out or eliminate other effects um, that would explain this relationship. That really supports internal validity, right, or the, the strength of the arguments you're making. Um, there's a couple other examples your uh, book uses that I think I would uh, reference and encourage you to go look at and think about, you know, the sort of uh, uh, relationship eating disorders to sort of family meals has been discussed, but, um, you know, can you really argue that the validity is clear there, that there's an association there, uh, or studies like this and the second correlational study are really maybe capturing something deeper or some third variable uh, that could be explaining these, that it's not isolated through that study. And that's also important for internal validity, right? Uh, but there's also a construct, right, whether it's representing that validity itself, of course, remember, the external, whether you've studied a wide variety of, let's say, individuals with eating disorders, so that you can uh, generalize these results to hopefully the general population of uh, young people with eating disorders, as well as that statistical validity, right? Uh, that argument that... Uh, the um, statistics verify and add argument to what you're speaking to, right? Statistical validity is one of those types of validity that looks at the statistical significance and not just the significance, but the maybe strength or depending on the statistic you're looking at, the uh, maybe extent of, you know, the conservative nature of probability, let's say. If your p-value is p less than 0.05, it means 5% of the time uh, you may be making an erroneous decision, or, you know, um, you're finding that uh, difference in means or that size correlation by chance alone, right? So it's the sort of um, estimate of confidence that you have in correlations and a lot of validity estimates that's the size or the strength of the correlation, right? Um, but this leads us to two types of errors we can make when we're looking at our uh, confidence in our decisions, right, and the validity of our assumptions. Type 1 errors are there's uh, errors we make where we say there's a difference. We're saying that our independent variable has an effect or that these two variables are related, and in fact, in reality, there is no difference or relationship present there. Right, that's a type 1 error and kind of uh, the worst error for science. Uh, we'd almost rather make a type 2 error, uh, which is not finding a statistical difference, uh, where one might be there. There might be some effect of this independent variable, but our study maybe wasn't strong enough to detect it. Um, or we use, you know, statistical significance testing that, you know, didn't come out as p less than 0.05, maybe it was p less than 0.08, or p equals, I should say, p uh, equals 0.08. Uh, and that would mean an 8% chance that that, you know, was by chance alone. So we say that's not beyond chance or significant enough in psychology, um, but that means that there, there may be a, an effect there, there may be a relationship, and we just need to try a little bit harder to find it to make sure we're not getting something that's spurious or that's, uh, um, you know, just a, a happenstance finding that 
there is no relationship or is there, there no difference, right? So, of course, you know, we make these serious uh, uh, conclusions. So we have to beware of the threats that exist that could maybe harm our internal validity or these other types of validity we talk about um, to make sure that our conclusions are accurate, right? And, and many things can come in the way. You know, there's a variety of things like history. We've mentioned these before. Repeated testing uh, by getting the same measurement device over and over again. And that could, you know, lessen the meaningfulness or the realness of that uh, instrument, right? Um, things like regression and the mean are where uh, repeated testing actually eventually gets to the person's uh, uh, homeostatic or average level of that variable. Uh, we say they regress to the mean um, because certain extreme scores may be their first or second administration and look like then uh, a change due to something else, but it's really just them returning to their baseline uh, on that measure uh, and look like some sort of an effect that we're trying to capture, right? Uh, things like experimental bias are important, you know, uh, the experiment or causing the effect they think could be coming from the IV. Um, that's just like, you know, anything else, an instrument or um, history coming in the way, right, that uh, creates the effect that you think could be from the independent variable uh, and muddies that sort of conclusion. Uh, mortality, the people who drop out of the study, uh, you know, maybe certain people dropping out, uh, that could change the relationship. Uh, that could also hurt the generalizability, of course, because if you have less people of diverse backgrounds, you know, then you can't necessarily say that this study or these results will hold for all of those different uh, types of people, uh, young and old, let's say. Uh, you may select uh, participants that, you know, this has uh, less meaning for or special meaning for. Either way, that can go bad. Maturation means they change over time, and the selection by maturation interaction is kind of an interesting threat to validity uh, in that you may select certain people, let's say highly intelligent people, that react to measures or mature over the course of the study, you know, change in their perceptions of these variables, uh, and then those variables have different effects on them, right? So uh, people can change different, uh, especially when you think of longitudinal type studies, uh, but even over the course of a smaller uh, within subject type experiment, uh, people uh, can change their attitudes, uh, or even within a 30 item measurement scale, people can sometimes change the way they see the items and then maybe your reliability will go down, which is a type of internal validity. External validity can be threatened by a lot of things that are very complicated or very simple when you think about the generalizability, right? So do these people seem like people that wouldn't be in the study, right? So getting a pretest, right? Um, that is not a real life sort of situation in many cases. Um, so getting that pretest may actually then change the way they react to some sort of uh, independent variable or treatment, right? Uh, so that interaction there could then uh, uh, create a situation that this study doesn't work the same way uh, as it would in real life, right? Same way this certain people you select for this study could react uh, in different ways to the treatment than uh, people in the real world. Uh, receiving multiple treatments like within a within subjects type design could make you, you know, respond to those treatments and really be answering the dependent variables, right, because treatments are the independent variables, uh, respond to those dependent variables in ways that are not necessarily honest or uh, uh, truly based on just the treatment alone, right? Anyways, the specificity of variables can be analyzed to see if uh, maybe you're too broad or too specific in your identification uh, that may not be, of course, paralleled in the real world. Um, treatment diffusion, you know, so that is where, uh, let's say, workers in an organization get a training. Other workers who are not trained uh, somehow get privy to that information. Uh, therefore, those two groups are not as different as they could be. Uh, and in that case, it might be more likely you make that type 2 error, uh, not find a difference between the groups that you expect to, because each group got a little bit of the information from the other. Uh, in this case, the untrained group got some of the information from the trained group uh, and maybe weren't as likely to commit those bad behaviors. Um, keeping the groups very different would help with that type 1, right? To, or more likely cause a type 1 and see some difference uh, that may not actually uh, exist. Anyways, those experimental effects could be important here too. Experiments don't exist in the real world, and people could just be reactive to the uh, laboratory setting or the measurement devices in some way, right? 
There's also threats that uh, are kind of common to both reliability and validity that are more uh, centered to the types of people you might have in studies or the types of personality you might interact with within a research setting, right? So things like social desirability, a type of personality um, sort of trait that uh, makes people act in ways that seem like the appropriate behavior uh, or respond in ways that seem appropriate, right? So. Uh, this could be especially problematic in uh, uh, studies about, let's say, counterproductive behaviors at work or uh, uh, bad health behaviors. People don't want to necessarily respond that they do stuff, maybe that they do, that they eat that whole thing of cookies um, uh, or, or don't, right? But uh, in some cases, you may not want to admit exactly what you're doing. Um, so you say what you think you should be saying. And in other cases, this is sort of a self-monitoring sort of process, right? You're making sure... Uh, what people are thinking about you or how people are viewing you, right? Um, and even things like NA and PA or negative affect and positive affect, basic negative and positive mood, uh, can really influence the way people respond to measures or see um, constructs or view interventions that they are uh, exposed to. Reactivity is actually higher or lower in some people. So anxiety, other sorts of experiences uh, in their history or personal biographies may uh, increase their reactivity and uh, make them more or less, you know, um, affected by the intervention itself, maybe just affected by uh, the intervention process. Uh, so not the variables you're trying to, to moderate uh, within their environment, but just the whole environment itself could be um, creating some sort of outcome that you're capturing uh, that you don't intend to, right? Um, anyways, response biases, uh, things like halo, leniency, and general bias, those can be especially problematic for reliability because, um, you know, if everybody has the same answer, there's no variation there, and correlations need variability. Um, so these sorts of uh, response biases can harm our correlations that are used to sort of create the indices of reliability and validity. And, of course, experimental bias and demand characteristics are always present in these things. Uh, in the case of reliability and validity, um, just that sort of suppressing or exacerbating effect of uh, the experimenter sort of pushing people in a certain direction um, could really be a threat to uh, the validity there. And demand characteristics can kind of maybe suppress answers and maybe create less variability and uh, less reliability. Some final thoughts on reliability and validity. Um, first of all, remember that they're a linked set of concepts, right? One cannot have a valid study uh, without having reliable measurement devices, whether those are observations, biological tests, or questions on a survey. Uh, you need to make sure that those all are asking things in a consistent way, and, and then hopefully also uh, in an accurate, construct, valid way. Um, also, there are specific reliabilities for different types of assessments, right? So we talk about these sort of qualitative versus quantitative sorts of reliability assessments. And not only are there different processes for calculating that statistically, but different ways of reporting that. Um, so that's definitely something to consider uh, when looking through the appendices or APA manuals or things like that. Uh, and then finally, that multiple forms of usability should be considered uh, when looking at your own results or deciphering your results or uh, figuring out what could be threats particularly to your own study, right, or the studies that you're reading. Um, what could be something that is maybe harming the internal, external validity, uh, maybe something about the settings or the participants, or maybe some of those more interactive sorts of things that the types of participants in these studies could be um, different than the average participant uh, that you might find. Hopefully that makes sense, uh, and these concepts are maybe coming together a little bit better for you over time.